Welcome. Great to see you all. Hello out there to the wild world of Web3. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today. We got a conversation on a hot button topic of the moment, Bitcoin ordinals. And uh, we're, we're uh, privileged to have some awesome uh, expert guests today to chime in. They've uh, They've been going back and forth on Twitter about it and and reading research papers and playing with all the tools and resources. So I'm excited to get their insight onto the situation. Um, what's up? I'm Joe Bender, Community Manager at Hero, and I am joined today by Dewaka Gupta, CTO at Hero, Patrick Stanley, founder of Freehold, and we're waiting on Trevor Owens to trickle in the managing partner at Stacks Ventures. Um, why don't we go around the horn and, and say hello, uh, tell us a little bit about about yourself, what you do, and, and why you're excited about Bitcoin ordinals. Um, yeah, Dawker, you want to go first, Walker? Uh, sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Dawker. I'm the CTO at Hero. Um, I've been uh, here with uh, this company for just about four years now. And um, uh, in terms of like why, why I'm excited about ordinals, uh, I feel like we've been preaching the gospel of building on Bitcoin since forever. Uh, and it's really uh, awesome to see kind of ordinals reinvigorate um, the the excitement and interest and conversations uh, around Bitcoin. So, uh, so yeah, I, you know, I, I love um, the the excitement, the energy that it's bringing, and really kind of um, showing what's possible um, uh, on Bitcoin, and also where the the limitations are of doing uh, things on a on a layer one. Um, so, so we'll get into some of those details uh, later, but uh, super excited to be here. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Walker. Um, I'm Patrick Stanley, um, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about ordinals because I've been into Bitcoin since like 2012, and I got into it for uh, the hard money aspect of it. I thought I think um, that was like a computer science problem that had been worked on for decades and finally got cracked, um, and um, for that whole time, I had always been kind of viewing Bitcoin as the sort of ledger of record, but in practice, it wasn't really being used as that if you don't count um, just financial transactions. So now that ordinals are here, I think there's something uh, unprecedented that's going to happen. Um, and um, basically, it's like we have hard money now. And now we also have hard media. Um, so it's just like endlessly, it's like a, it's like a whole new rabbit hole to go down. Like if you, if you thought Bitcoin was a rabbit hole, I think ordinals will prove to be uh, a rabbit hole as well. That, um, that has a lot of interesting outcomes, uh, that will occur over the next decade. Uh, if, if the pace of, you know, uh, people inscribing and the demand stays up. So it's exciting. Nice. And now we've got Trevor, uh, we're going around the horn saying hello and, and chiming in. Awesome. Hey, everybody. I'm Trevor Owens, uh, managing partner at Stax Ventures. I love ordinals. I'm excited to talk about them. Hell yeah. I love to hear it. And <laughs> we a, also that's an have... understatement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Up in the middle of the night in, in Asia, talking to ordinals. We love to see it. Um, Trevor, and Trevor's we also... brain have rehardwired to like have the word ordinal like embedded into it. Like a television. You guys didn't, that's like you guys didn't see my tattoo that says ordinals, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been inscribed your, yourself over there. He just mounts um, his sleep now too. Ordinals. <laughs> It's how he yawns. Um, we also have Jamil Dahani, founder of uh, Gamma IO over there, one of the biggest NFT marketplaces on Stacks. Um, really dove in the Ordinals uh, um, pool there head first. Um, why don't you say hello and and tell us about what you're up to over there? Hey everyone, yeah, I'm, I'm Jamil, founder of Gamma.io, um, and yeah, we're super excited about Ordinals. We're we're you know, diving in um, yeah, within within a basically a couple hundred inscriptions, we knew that uh, this was this was the place to be, um, and launched our inscription service where you can without um, you know without within like five minutes you'll be able to inscribe your own ordinal using gamma.io/ordinals, and we're excited to continue to deliver more tooling, more infrastructure, and more abilities for you know users, creators, and collectors alike um, to to dive into the Bitcoin NFT world. Nice, love to see it. So many Stacks developers really, really diving diving in and and having an impact. You know, making making the tools that 
everyday users need to, to play around with, with new things. Um, so all this talk of NFTs, it may trick you into thinking it's 2018, but uh, it's not, it's 2023. And these are not your grandfather's NFTs. Um, actually, they're technically not NFTs at all. Uh, Bitcoin ordinals are a totally new innovation in the Bitcoin ecosystem, kind of allows node operators to inscribe data into each and every Satoshi or SAT for short, each Bitcoin has 100 million SATs contained within it. Um, now in blockchain world, we know how important and powerful the ability to write data onto the blockchain can be. Um, in this case, our friend developer Casey Rodemar uh, leveraged the Taproot upgrade and configured the data being written to Bitcoin in a particular way that enables what he calls digital artifacts. Um, these digital artifacts kind of replicate the functionality of a non-fungible token, but have some totally unprecedented design principles that make them really special. Uh, unlike Ethereum NFTs, Bitcoin ordinals are complete, we're calling them. That means they have no external dependencies, no links out to IPFS storage, no complex royalty mechanism muddying the tokenomics. They are 100% immutable. Some would even argue that Bitcoin ordinals are like almost an improvement on NFTs and how they should have been designed in the first place. No sidechain, no token, no decentralized storage provider, just Bitcoin. However, that is why we're here to have an informed discussion about a, an exciting new technology with experts that are passionate, in Trevor's case, extremely passionate about them. Um, so no time to waste. It's time to learn more denials about ordinals. That will be my only pun. I get one. Um, so let's talk traction to date um, and why people are so excited about them. They just launched on January 21st and have had a meteoric rise in popularity and usage. Ordinals punks, ordinals apes, ordinals checks, uh, the floodgates have really opened. Um, so I'm interested to get our guest perspectives on why ordinals have so quickly captured the hearts and mind of uh, not only Bitcoiners, but the wider Web3 world in general. Um, what about them is technically interesting and why have they invigorated Bitcoin culture so immensely? I think you've had you've had um, the ability to do several of the, these things in isolation for a while. Like ordinal theory has been there for for a long time, and op return data and the ability to put data on the Bitcoin blockchain has been there for a while as well. Um, I think there are a couple of key unlocks here that have really resonated with people. I think as you started to see people use the first of all was Casey's or, ordinal theory, right? The ability to track BTC and assign it to each individual. That, that is like a prerequisite for everything, but it's not exciting enough on its own. But when you add ordinals, the ability to track Bitcoin throughout the life of the network and throughout the lifetime of an individual's transactions, plus the ability to immutably and forever inscribe any data on the blockchain, that becomes super powerful. If I inscribe something right now on, on the blockchain, it's 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 there and it's immediately broadcasted to everybody's node. It's on Michael Saylor's node. It's on Adam Back's node, whether he likes it or not. It's on Trevor's node. It's on DeWalker's node within minutes, right? And that is that, and, and it's going to be there for, forever. As soon as uh, one of us, you know, our node stops running, it's already broadcasted to another. It almost replicates itself for the lifetime of the network. And so I think. That is an incredibly powerful concept to store that data on L1 um, for a lifetime and with ordinal theory to assign, not only store it, but assign ownership to that data. It just opens up so much, so many more doors um, than before. And it's such a simple and elegant concept that I think resonates a lot with people um, compared to the complexity of Ethereum smart contracts and, and others that are just kind of, you know, ordinal theory seems complicated at first, but it's kind of an elegant thing. You're inscribing the raw data. You own this set. It's it's simple, right? And I, I and I think that's the beauty of of ordinals. And it's 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 one thing that that's been able to to capitalize on the traction and momentum around it. Yeah, Trevor, do you want to add something to that? I know you've been uh, and you've been hosting yeah, I, things. You have all, I mean, you have all like the good intro primer kind of. I, th I think there was three things. I think that it's uh, 
ordinals are useful, they're different, and they're also controversial. And I think those three things came together in a way that created a perfect storm um, that uh, have led to the extreme traction. So from a from a useful perspective, um, um, I mean, it's they, despite being on Bitcoin with ha which having a limited scripting language, we you get pretty much the 2080 of what NFTs can do on an Ethereum, right? So you can transfer them just like Bitcoin. You don't even have to have a smart contract. In fact, if you were to upload music onto Ethereum as a musician, you would have to, you know, you wouldn't be able to, it would be more challenging than to just upload an ordinal with a music file. Um, and so there's quite a few um, uh, simplifications that are, are quite useful and it works out of the box. And then it's different because um, the way that ERC-721s work on Ethereum, um, they uh, are very loose. Like, you know, the uh, you have mutable data, you have a, you can have centralized servers, um, you know, you can have IPFS. Um, you go into OpenSea and you buy an FT, uh, it's a mixed bag. Like it, you still get like the token and everything and the image, but the actual underlying uh, tech of it is a mixed bag. Some of the metadata is frozen, some of it's not your nft is unrevealed maybe the developer has the ability to change the rarity you don't even know it all open does they put a little snowflake emblem like somewhere like in a in a drop down or in an accordion widget that you can like have to look for and know what you're looking for for me as a, as a developer and an nft collector that was a big surprise that these erc 721s are so um loose in terms of they can be all types of uh, different range of quality and security guarantees and longevity guarantees now with ordinals all of that is gone because they're all of them are given the highest longevity and security guarantee possible. They're literally uploaded onto Bitcoin. And so they're more expensive, but they're also uh, superior in sort of the, in terms of the longevity fees are not that bad right now. So the timing is quite, is quite good for that. Um, and so that's, that's how it's different. Like, I think this is sort of dialing up uh, just, just like Solana is as, fast and scalable as possible and as minimally decentralized as possible, whereas Bitcoin is slow and steady and as decentralized as possible. These ordinals are as decentralized, as simple, and as durable as possible. You can't get you can't dial it up anymore. And so that's a, a useful a useful thing about it um, from a a different perspective. As I said, it's also giving you kind of the 2080 of what you expect from an NFT without having small contracts. And then this was very controversial. So we have sort of lived in this um, two-year period where uh, the Bitcoin Maxi community has had a cognitive dissonance due to the fact that so many ex exciting things were happening on Ethereum or like the NFT community uh, market, you know, went through this sort of bubble, right, of, of excitement. And so um, when you are, you know, on Bitcoin and you don't have that type of functionality, you kind of dismiss it. You're like, oh, that's, it's all scams. It's all shit coins. You know, Vitalik should go to jail. What, you know, what's going on there? You know, uh, SEC, please come in and shut down Ethereum, you know? And now, and they, there's even this narrative, oh, uh, Bitcoin and crypto, it's not the same. Bitcoin is not part of crypto. It's Bitcoin. We don't have NFTs. This is what little bit Bitcoin and Max are saying. We don't have NFTs. Guess what? Now you do. And so they tried to literally stop this, like, uh, and and the thing is, you can't stop it. You can't. No one controls Bitcoin, and so I think there was this culture of sort of toxic maximalism, born out of the of the two, 2017s, um, You know, when all this kind of um, stuff was a lot of bullshit in the market, but now that we have real use cases, real end user value, we're playing in a different arena where a lot of the technologies of NFTs and other use cases are proven out. And um, this sort of popped the bubble, you know, it was kind of like a, a fracturing of the culture in a way where I think the truth, the truth won out that this technology is useful. And, yeah, and, totally. Yeah. I think, do I think, um, I think uh, I, I want to just like mention one thing just for folks who are kind of like, what, what is Trevor talking about? Why is the, what, why was like the Bitcoin culture uh, weird like that? Um like why was it in a cultural rut basically? And why was like nothing being built on Bitcoin? Um, then I think we should maybe maybe like look at some of these questions and see if we can like make some some head headway on 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 those. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, basically, um, 
Yeah, Bitcoin has limited, limited scripting language uh, and is just like very hard to program with. Um, I think people didn't really think you could like really do NFTs on layer layer one, but now you can actually do like 10x better NFTs on layer one on Bitcoin because you're literally putting those images on chain. They're not stored on IPFS where there's some sort of uh, game theory that you need to uphold that we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know if it'll be lasting or not. These things are stored on Bitcoin. We know Bitcoin will be here forever. So this is like, like these are early ordinal inscriptions are like cave paintings um, um, for now. Like the, this is like a time capsule that um, can't be washed away. Um, yeah, and uh, because Bitcoin was so limited, I think a lot of non-technical people are uh, just like kind of status-driven people on Twitter who um, are basically, um, they're basically, for, they're basically, uh, their culture was defined by the Twitter algorithm. So basically they developed like a hollow uh, sort of um, set of principles that were um, basically defined for maximizing engagement and likes on Twitter. And so what's happened now, with ordinals is that um, the place to uh, the place to focus on is actually on chain, not on Twitter. So we're not focusing on maximizing likes on Twitter. We're focusing on things like maybe maximizing fees on chain, and 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 writing what you have to say in the permanent ledger of record. And so um, in literally forty eight hours after ten, after the years and years and years of cultural decay caused largely in part from by the Twitter algorithm, um, uh, moral rectitude of the sort of um, um, vocal minority of, of Bitcoiners uh, has be, been completely inverted. And part of that is not just due to sensibility. It's also due to uh, lack of actual skin in the game. A lot of the people who are playing status games and identity politics didn't actually hold Bitcoin. So they can't even afford to inscribe. So the people who... And we were kind of letting Bitcoin culture, like the tail wag the dog of Bitcoin culture. And these are just people who are um, people who are kind of driving culture into a rut. And um, now basically culture is all on chain. And the cool thing about that is that, you know, in a, in a civilization, you don't just have money. You also have art. You, all, you, have, you, know, you don't just have Edison. You also have Bach, you know, so like these things are equally worth uh, appreciating and investing into. So uh, that's I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that, I think. I think Bitcoin now has a chance for the first time to actually establish a real culture that reaches out into in into the world, uh, and is not defined by narrow uh, a narrow sort of uh, local maximum of, of thinking of what Bitcoin can and should do. Golden jewelry too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Wow! Definitely resonate with with everything you're saying about Bitcoin culture and. Uh, I mean, regardless of the reasons for it, it, it's been incredible to see kind of uh, Bitcoin culture catalyzed this week and, and the conversation get reignited about Bitcoin innovation and what it can be and what it can do. Um, all right. So we we have talked about the cultural impact of, of Bitcoin ordinals. Memes are fun and, and the Twitter wars are always spicy, but uh, blockchain will always come down to the technology. Um, I think a lot of our audience is curious about what is happening under the hood. Um, we got, got a lot of questions in the chat. How do I inscribe an ordinal? What is an ordinal? How does it work? Um, how do they differ from colored coins? What does it mean inscribing an ordinal? So we're going to bundle all of these questions under. Um, would love for you to chat a bit about the process of inscribing a Bitcoin ordinal what crypto magic is happening in the background that enables digital artifacts. Um, and DeWalker said at the top of the hour, I, I would love to hear what's easy about it, what's efficient about it, maybe what are some of the challenges or roadblocks with it, it, it being a nascent technology. Um, take it away, let's talk tech. Yeah, uh, so maybe I'll just first do like a very quick primer on what exactly are ordinals and inscriptions and, and try to kind of break that down because I think sometimes can be a little bit of a mystery. Uh, and it took me a while to really like, you know, figure it out, out for myself as well. So hopefully it's useful. So when we talk about ordinals, um, there's really kind of two components. One is, you know, I think what Jamil referred to as ordinal theory, and I'll talk about what that is. And then the second piece is inscriptions, and I'll talk about how those work. So first, the, the big thing about ordinals, the ordinal theory component of it is really just a convention. It's a naming or numbering convention. 
So if you think about it, you know, we have 21 million Bitcoin blocks. So we know the total number of Bitcoin that will ever be a priori. Each Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshis. And so if you agree upon a convention, let's say, you know, the first uh, Satoshi to be sort of mined in any Bitcoin block, I'm going to number them in those order. So you can take the Bitcoin block number and the index of the Satoshi within it in the order it which was mined. That gives you a unique way of numbering every single Satoshi that ever was, that is, and ever will be. But as the, the word convention indicates, it is a convention. So it only makes sense if people agree upon using this convention. And so the utility or meaning or significance of Bitcoin uh, of ordinals really comes from people agreeing upon this convention. Um, uh, as Jamil said, this is not a new idea. Uh, in fact, this exact same numbering scheme was first proposed all the way back in 2012 and has since been sort of independently discovered, proposed by many people. Um, and, and so that's one part of it. So that's the ordinal part of the, you know, this an ordering scheme. So that's where the ordinal come from. So now we have a convention of numbering these Satoshis. And someone also asked a question, you know, what, what does it mean for Bitcoin's fungibility? Uh, so it doesn't really affect like Bitcoin's fungibility necessarily. Like you can still treat, um, you know, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. But if you choose to opt into this convention, you can ascribe some non-fungible uh, attributes to, to Bitcoin. So you can say, oh, Satoshi number 100 in Bitcoin block 100 uh, is a specific Satoshi. And, and then I can transfer this Satoshi, I can add some other attributes to the Satoshi. And so it introduces some non-fungibility uh, and that's where the digital artifact piece comes in. So, so that's kind of the ordering aspect. Now let's talk about um, inscriptions. So to, to understand sort of how inscriptions work, I, I need to very quickly explain um, some upgrades that have happened in Bitcoin. So I think it's important to realize that this is not happening in a vacuum and it's not something that just happened overnight. A bunch of things had to come into place for inscriptions to even be possible. So back in 2017, there was an upgrade in Bitcoin called SegWit. Um, so that stands for segregated witness. It's kind of a weird uh, phrasing. What does that even mean? So at a very high level, if you think about you know, a Bitcoin transaction, um, each transaction has uh, some inputs that are telling sort of you know, where, uh, the, the inputs that are coming in to a transaction, where's the Bitcoin coming from and where it's going. So each of these inputs and outputs, the inputs typically have some sort of signature or proof attached to them that basically says this input can unlock some previous output. Um, and, and in prior to 2017, all of these inputs, the proofs and the outputs were all sort of intermingled throughout the block. And that posed some limitations. So the SegWit upgrade, the segregated witness portion of it essentially says, let's take all of the signatures, all of the proofs, or you can also call them as witnesses. So let's take all of these witnesses and we we'll bundle them uh, towards the end of the block in a dedicated section. And we'll just have all of the input outputs all together. So, so that's what the SegWit upgrade does, right? It segregates all of the proofs or witnesses in one section of the block. So that upgrade went live in 2017. Uh, an upgrade on top of that uh, that came uh, online last year is Taproot. And so what Taproot uh, allows you to do is, among other things, it says you can have more complex sort of proofs or witnesses. And, and in particular, um, it sort of relaxes a bunch of the limitations. So, so you can say, you know, I have five different ways of uh, unlocking this particular output. So imagine you have one lock and five different keys that can potentially unlock that lock. And, and Taproot essentially says, you don't have to tell anyone what all these five keys are. You can just show me one of the keys that unlocks this lock and give me a proof uh, that it works. And so, so this, there, this is where this notion of kind of revealing one of these uh, scripts comes into play. So, so Taproot builds on the idea of SegWit to say, you can provide me a witness uh, and of the many possible ways of unlocking a particular um, output, you only have to reveal one of those possible ways. Okay, so now we have so this background of you know, SegWit that moves all of the witnesses in one location and Taproot that allows the witnesses to be of a certain size and, and allows us to reveal one way of unlocking an input. That's, those are the concepts that the inscription builds upon. So the way an inscription works is uh, you take one of these Satoshis, uh, which we have established a numbering system for, you say that, hey, I'm going to send this Satoshi as an output and I'm going to attach um, uh, uh, a lock to this output. And to unlock that lock, uh, I'm going to provide a, a key that basically is you know, going to be my inscription content. Uh, and in the process of revealing that key, you end up uh, putting the 
um, contents uh, of you know whatever you're choosing to inscribe uh, that goes on chain and there is a way specific way of encoding this content as a taproot script so that's kind of uh, the basics of how it works um, and i think the uh, really neat thing that uh, Casey was able to do with this tool, um, kudos to him for that, is to really package it up uh, in in uh, a way that you know is accessible to people, right? So even using the verb inscribe, I thought was great, uh, where or using the term digital artifact that you are inscribing something, it makes it very visceral, uh, and you can understand. Okay, I'm going to take a file and I'm going to inscribe it on Bitcoin. Um, so. So that's the you know how it works under the hood. Um, and if people are curious about you know how do you actually go about inscribing an ordinal yourself, uh, happy to go over that as well. But uh, let me pause here and see if there are any follow ups to that. Yeah, definitely have a lot of questions just uh, on like edge case stuff. Um, what would happen to the block size if ordinals becomes very popular or can you inscribe on top of an ordinal like graffiti, somebody said. Um, anyone else want to chime in with some technical hot takes on it? Yeah, so you, you can inscribe the same Satoshi multiple times. Um, also, when you get an ordinal, it's you, you can't... Sub submit a single satoshi so they're actually packed in like ten thousand satoshis so they have enough um room to also be transferred a few times um we do have um you know the tooling is really bad for this stuff right now but it's changing fast in fact uh a company called xverse which is in our portfolio and and well known in in the stacks community just launched uh a web wallet that you can actually uh, receive and view your ordinals. That's a game changer. Like there's no, there was no wall to view these, you know, it would basically just, you would inscribe them, you'd see that they're there. And then you would like see the code in your, in your wallet and track it to the website. Now we actually, for the first day, like it's even a few hours, it's been live, can actually see it in a web wallet, like a MetaMask type experience or a phantom wallet type experience. Um, and sending is not available yet that should be available like tomorrow but the tooling has come out very quickly there's no marketplaces what most people are doing is they're wrapping them in emblem vault which is a um uh a semi-centralized um private key um uh storage that will allow you to um uh store the private key for the bitcoin wallet in an in essentially an erc ethereum uh 721 token and then you can burn it to, to claim the wallet back um, so that's people have been selling those on OpenSea. Uh, the Bitcoin punks, very controversial. Uh, so of course, the first thing that people are going to do is they're going to they're going to copy uh, other people's stuff and inscribe that. That's like always almost 100 percent guaranteed to happen whenever something new comes out. Um, and um, yeah, like Jamil, what do you what do you have cooking? Yeah, so one thing we're looking at um, very deeply is, first of all, um, creator tools, of course, I think are the heart of anything. You want to allow creators to launch collections and to get their work out there into the world. Because at the heart of any marketplace, we wouldn't exist without artists and creators and people that actually create their work. So within the next few days, we're going to be announcing more exciting things coming, coming there. I think that's going to create, like just as Trevor mentioned, there's Emblem Vault um, for Bitcoin punks, but there's a lot of like copies and duplicates and there's no concept of like what a collection is. So that's one thing that we're looking into solving um, at, at Gamma is like this, this idea of like provenance for collections and getting that locked down first, because before you have a marketplace, you need to have collections. But uh, right after that, there are some very interesting and creative ways that you can actually do um, a lot of this trading and a lot of this functionality on Bitcoin L1. And I think it's going to be very important as we start to explore ordinals, um, how we can maximize the potential of doing things directly on Bitcoin, because we've seen this sort of thesis playing out with ordinals that people care about settlement directly on Bitcoin. Those scaling solutions are important in the future. It would be ridiculous to think like in the days of CryptoPunks that you need to put them on Polygon or something. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you maximize what you can do uh, with the base layer and then continue to expand and continue to grow. And so what we're looking at is enabling native trading and really pushing the limits of what we can do um, programmatically with ordinals for both collectors, creators, and users. 
And you guys have a no code inscription tool people can use today, gamma.com, or sorry, gamma.io, right? Gamma.io. And it inscribes for you, no code, no need, no, um, uh, no nothing, right? Just go onto the website yeah, just, and- It'll take 30 seconds. You just go to the website, you see it directly on the splash page to inscribe an ordinal, and you'll be able to drag and drop an image, uh, scan a QR code, pay the network fees, and uh, and, and you're all set. Yeah, and this is already such a huge step forward because if you wanted to do inscribe an ordinal by yourself from scratch, and if you're like don't have the infrastructure set up, like it's like a three day process. So, uh, having gone through that myself, I can attest that this is a huge step forward. Yeah, uh, I, sorry, I, I remember saying something. Oh, go ahead, Jamil. Yeah, yeah, I, I I was like, it was so frustrating because I remember seeing like ordinal number one hundred and fifty or something, and I'm like, I want to get I want to get in in here, and then by the time my node was synced, it was like six hundred already. You know, there's like three days or something to get it all set up. No. Yeah. I wanted to just make a comment about something, Jamil, you were saying earlier. I think um, uh, right now, sort of the, it, it feels like a fresh canvas because, you know, ordinals and inscriptions in some sense, um, it's, it, the, it's, it's just like a raw data storage. There is no semantics attached to it. And, and so right now is the time for the community to kind of come together and folks to be creative and, and really overlay some sort of semantic meaning on top of like all of the structure. Like right now people are just, you know, stuffing in, you know, whatever comes to, to people's minds. And, and there isn't really a lot of um, uh, semantic meaning on top of that. So for example, you know, just even questions like how do you identify a collection uh, versus, you know, just like a, a sequence of images that have no relationship with each other. Um, so, so that's something that, you know, here as a company is also very interested in, in sort of looking at what sort of tooling and infrastructure it does not exist around ordinals. Uh, and how can we make it easier for people to build applications on top of that? So, uh, so yeah, we're we're actively looking at a lot of different ideas, and um, hope to share more with the community in the coming uh, days and weeks. Yeah, and, nice. and Jamil, you, you 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 guys also have um, uh, inscription viewer as well, right? You because um, I saw that D Gods, a very famous Solana project that's moving to Ethereum and Polygon they um, made some ordinals and they referenced to Gamma, right? Yeah, what we did is we basically, uh, through this concept of creating collections, we wanted not to just create an ordinals viewer that's similar to the one on ordinals.com where it's kind of like just a stream, although that's important as well. We wanted to create a place where people could come to and see what's part of a canonical collection because right now anybody can copy and, and inscribe another one of those d gods um, but there's only those 535 d gods that were inscribed in that one block um, all, all next to each other and so um, for ordinal punks for d gods and for a few other collections we rolled out those collection pages where you can see what a canonical collection is um, and this this really is a first step to creating kind of like this community and and marketplace around specific collections around specific communities um and and, and bootstrapping that so um we're going to roll that out more broadly we sort of did a soft launch of that with d gods and with ordinal punks um but we're going to allow anybody to basically come in and say claim this is our collection we'll go through a manual verification process right now um eventually we'll do something um uh, on chain uh verification as well uh, of collection ownership and collection uh, collection creation, uh, but we're super excited about that and, and rolling it out more further. I see a couple of questions about um, uh, you know ordinals uh, potentially coming uh, in at the expense of um, SDX uh, or um, alternatively, sort of how does tax benefit from the exposure ordinals is getting? Uh, I certainly have my own, own thoughts on it, but I would love to to hear from uh, maybe Trevor and Patrick uh, first on this kind of how do you see ordinals playing out, and you know how how does that how does tax uh, fit into that picture? Oh, I mean, it's it's the breakthrough that we've been waiting for on stacks for real. I mean, I, I think um, mo the most significant thing about this for me is really the cultural and historical relevance to Bitcoin culture. I think. Um, you know, if 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 Bitcoin culture was like a uh, you know within Bitcoin culture, I almost think of it like the fall the falling of the of the Berlin Wall, like the end of communism, um, because um, you end up having um, uh, an awakening and sort of a uh, coming together, both of the Ethereum and Bitcoin community, 
um, Bitcoiners had, you know, looked looked down on people who are in Ethereum and Web3. And now thousands of them have come over to Bitcoin and, and started running Bitcoin nodes. And you 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 know you, you can't look someone in the eyes and hate them anymore. And so I think this is um as a community between um Ethereum Bitcoin and the rest of the the the, the web three world, we are fighting against the legacy system and we need to work together to succeed. Um, if we don't, the the incumbents in the fiat system will win. And so if we're divided, we can't we can't win in this fight to change um, uh, the, the the broader world. But now coming together and realizing that hey, we're 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 all on the same team um, is a is a massive moment. And I think it also uh, le- not only legitimizes it like NFTs and and legitimizes Ethereum, but it also legitimizes Bitcoin as a place for the future of Web three. And so we're seeing a lot of investor interest, um, you know, coming in to this. Um, and we're seeing a lot of users come coming into this now. And so um, I think it's uh, it's huge for Stacks. I mean, um, and it, it proves that there's demand for other use cases on top of Bitcoin. Um, and um, I think it, I think it means that that um, I think that Stacks can learn a lot from this in terms of how we approach developing products. Um, I think Jamil hit the nail on the head and being like. You need to build for today, not build for tomorrow. Um, you know, a, a startup um, when you're when you're just starting a startup, two people in a garage, scalability is not the thing that you worry about, right? You worry about getting in the hands of users, and and find that product market fit. And Ordinals clearly found that product market fit um, by identifying a, a clear now in retrospect a clear weakness in in the ER, ERC seven twenty one standard um, that I think many people may have picked up on, but nobody drove home in the way that they did. Um, and so this is, this is really uh, big for stacks, you know? Um, and if you look on gamma, you'll see the volume, like Jamil, how has the volume been doing? And how for, is the stacks, how is the stacks, you know, trading right now? Oh yeah. Are you guys, are like, you guys following the, the markets at all? Cause it's stacks is doing really good right now. <laughs> as soon as, as soon as we launched our inscription service and, and, uh, we didn't we didn't have anything about stacks in our inscription. You didn't need, don't need to connect your stacks wallet. You don't need to do anything stacks related. And we saw volumes on BNS, on Megapon, on Satoshiables um, exceeding in just a few days what had been like monthly volumes before. So we didn't target, we didn't even expect that. We didn't even like build for that. I think the goal is not to, you know, like pump the L2 and like feel insecure about where you are. The goal is to like build things that are useful, build things that people love. And, you know, as time goes on, it's inevitable, right? Like people will need L2s, but we don't need, you don't need to push that right now, right? You need to build what's, what's, what's going to be impactful for for people and what helps people first, because that's, that's what wins. And it's not, not looking at the technology. No great tech company actually looks at the technology first. All great tech companies look at the customer and the experience and helping people first. And I think that's the attitude that we've got to have in this community. Totally. And interestingly, Ordinals opened up the Web3 economy on Bitcoin, whether people like it or not. And you can't turn that omelet back into an egg. And now that it's there, it's there for good. And um, so that while that door has been cracked open, the stacks is like, the Stacks community is like is like bulldozing the whole wall down now that we, we've seen that. Um, and like Jamil said, we're not trying to insert Stacks where it doesn't need to be. Um, we're just being helpful and building tooling for this new Web3 uh, kind of primitive. Uh, just so happens Stacks has like a decade long uh, kind of understanding of both scaling solutions and other Web3 primitives um, that uh, can be quite complementary to ordinals. Things like namespaces that resolve, that you can sign into, that you can send Bitcoin to and from, that you can uh, have represent as like the sort of owner of of collections. So you're not you're not just dealing with long text strings and, and you're unsure who's who. Um, and there's a, and smart contracts wrap like wrapping wrapping assets, things like that. Uh, basically. Um, 
you know, Gamma, Xverse, Hero Wallet, and more um, uh, are right now, right now, like the reality right now is that .BTC builders are dominating ordinals. That's the reality. Dominating and, building, dominating building on ordinals. Yeah. 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 But that's, that's what really matters, <laughs> you and, know? And, so, and, 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 and the, the reason is because in order for an L2 to be valuable, the L1 has to have a lot of users. Like people don't need scaling technology until the L1 has so much usage that it's not scaling. <laughs> Right. And so the more we can bring people to Bitcoin and, and use the layer one, in the end, it will need to be scaled on a layer two. Right. And I think that's that's the point. Like if there's no one using Bitcoin L1, Stacks is in trouble. Right. But if if everybody on earth is using Bitcoin L1, then a lot of people are going to need uh, scaling uh, L2s like Stacks. Yeah, totally. Also, you, you notice how like, um, does anyone else kind of feel like, you know, the primary use case of Bitcoin was like hodling. And now the narrative is like shifted to like an actual economy. Like people will be like, yeah, we sell hats to like, you know, people in, uh, you know, some place or whatever. And we accept Bitcoin. It's like, yeah, but how much is getting, how much is actually getting used? Like not that much. Like that's like dirty little secret about Bitcoin is like, there really isn't like a, isn't like a massive Bitcoin economy that, exists and i think from a legitimacy legitimacy standpoint and from a uh, sort of order of operations standpoint i think the bitcoin economy on web3 makes sense makes total sense as like an actual starting point it's almost like a you know people say like um people say like quote unquote like the internet started when uh the pandemic happened because everyone went remote well, I feel like the sort of Bitcoin economy actually started in earnest uh, once ordinals started. And I, I think this would be a sort of obvious in hindsight, but um, really, really like not a whole lot was going on before then. And like people will cope and be like, yeah, sure, there is. Here's this example. It's like, no, not, not really. Um, also, what's really interesting about this ordinal thing is that it, it benefits Bitcoin by um, by by ensuring that there'll be, you know, security for the long term. It's like a belt and suspenders approach to security. You're not just dependent on uh, Bitcoin transactions. You're also, uh, you're all, you also have the secondary layer that, that provides another element of sort of safety to Bitcoin, which is like inscriptions. And so miners, miners love that. And, and that's, that's good for Bitcoin ultimately. And there, there's some other cool things about ordinals too. You know, it's it's ordinals is not just for NFTs. It's essentially like a censorship resistant document store. Like you could imagine uh, Tiananmen Square, like the Tank Man picture. Uh, and we're we're not living in the 1980s when when that happened. You know, we're living in the world of AI, uh, where a, a country with the right infrastructure can shut down the internet you know, with yeah. the, with the, the, with, with a but thumb it, snap and yeah. they can, they can remove content in audio in, in, in image in text. They can read the, the, the text on the image in a screenshot and they can, they have AI that's trained to, to immediately take it down. Um, and so, you know, we're like the, the rise of AI and I think the rise of, um, authoritarianism and, and COVID actually did put the world in some ways, uh, give control to some of the more authoritarian countries out there. Um, and so to have a easy to use and, uh, permanent censorship resistant document store, maybe something that our civilization needs, you know, at a key oh, moment. Yeah. I, I, I think this is going to have massive implications. I think, um, the ability to inscribe, uh, to Bitcoin, in an instant and have a whole network decide to inscribe certain uh, news or certain truths can actually be a deterrent to uh, other uh, sort of powers that are trying to uh, subjugate their citizens or, or what have you. I, I think it's actually like, it's a shield and a sword. Um, um, and I think like, I think the implications of like a permanent ledger of record um, that's like native to like the sort of crypto capital uh uh, geopolitical poll uh, is uh, just as important, if not more important, than uh, the implications of having a paper of record for uh, for the West or for having uh, for having a um, 
um, uh, uh, a state-controlled media uh, in the common in in some in some communist countries. It's like uh, crypto people, Bitcoin people, uh, basically uh, now don't just have uh, hard money and freedom to transact. They also have hard media and freedom to speak and have that have that speech inscribed forever. So that's actually like a, a fundamental uh, sort of internet right that just got kind of created in earnest. Um, in, like that wasn't really uh, that wasn't really like um, didn't have the sort of um, um, potency. Yeah, potency. But before, like, sure, you can put something on IPFS, um, but like, will it be there in ten years? Like, it might be. And I, I, or I'm, how would you find it? You know, like, you, yeah, um, exactly. searching like, in notorious yard. The incentive is is to keep it pinned. My incentive is to keep it pinned, not the whole network necessarily. We have more questions, I think. I think Maria said Gamma.io uses their full node to do this. Just, uh, did do we answer that or no? Yeah, we use that. We use our full node with with an ordinal indexer on top. We run we run a few. Yeah. Yeah, she also asked asked about the impact of ordinals on the fungibility of Bitcoin. Yeah, I think I think, um, I think we already covered that. Right. Jimmy, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, Bitcoin is still fungible. If, uh, it, like at, at at the standard, if you look at it without ordinal theory, and it's non fungible if you look at it with ordinal theory. It's kind of a confusing concept to wrap your head around, but that's the TLDR. And there's a there's a question about colored coins. So ordinals are a kind of colored coin. It's a subset of colored coins. Uh, someone's also asking, um, you know, what are your thoughts on the increased demand for block space and the subsequent increase in transaction costs coming from ordinals? I think there was a similar question before this as well. So uh, from my perspective, um, uh, you know, I think it's it's great for Bitcoin because, you know, as the uh, halving continues, uh, Bitcoin does need more transaction fees to kind of support the network. Uh, and whatever is good for Bitcoin, I think is good for uh, projects that build around it, all the Bitcoin layers, stacks included. Uh, and then it also exposes uh, limitations, right? So if there is so much demand for uh, ordinals that you know the block space is going to be a limit. Right now, the block size is limited to four megabytes, and that's a very touchy subject in Bitcoin circles. Uh, I think changing that block size is, is going to be very, very difficult, um, and and that will push uh, force some constraints on what is possible at that layer. Similarly, transaction fees I think are an all-time high and have you know, seen sort of a tenfold increase from just a few months ago. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the transaction fees go up another 10x from here. Uh, and, and that will still be okay for some use cases. You know, Maybe there's some high uh, touch things that you still want to inscribe uh, and you're willing to pay the premium for that. Uh, but then for other use cases, you, know, you might be okay with uh, uh, solutions that offer lower cost, uh, but more flexibility, more features. Uh, so, so overall, I think for Bitcoin layers, uh, I think this is fantastic. These are all great problems to have. Transaction fees too high, fantastic. This is an excellent problem to have. I'd much rather have that problem than, you know, no one is using the network or there are no use cases or there's no demand, there's no innovation. Uh, so these are all fantastic problems to have. Yeah, I think if you look at the mempool right now, um, anyone who's sending payments is getting in the next block, right? Like people are putting high fees to, to send their payments in and we're talking high fees, we're talking like one or $2 total fees, right? Compared to inscriptions, it's not a lot of money. And then you have this backlog in the mempool of like thousands, tens of thousands of transactions, you know, of inscriptions, of data that's going in that sort of acts as like a backstop for the fee market. And I think this is a really powerful concept. You know, the fact that you still have a robust fee market at the high end for payments and for instant settlements. But for miners, you also have the security of knowing that there's a long tail of payments that can act as like a um, act as a buffer, you know, as the block subsidies go down, as a downturn happens. And uh, this is a level of like security and, uh, and, and, and market dynamics that we just haven't had before. Yeah, I agree. I think the more fees, the better. Like the more expensive uh, Bitcoin base layer, the better, because the only way this scales is through lightning and stacks and other layers. Wasn't wasn't like the lowering fees like a big like a big blocker uh, sort of talking point back in like 2017? That's kind of odd, actually. Yeah. When you when you think it when you think about it, it, it that's kind of that's kind of funny. 
it's like the shoe is on the other foot now like the the people who are small blockers before are are having making big blocker arguments is that right yeah, I think the main thing that they're probably going to try to, uh, Trevor, sorry, uh, uh, is is probably pruning that data or, or or soft forking or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jamil, how many ordinals do you have, and Dewalker, how many do you have? Yeah, we got a couple of minutes left here. One of the questions I, I wanted to ask was uh, if you guys have been especially captivated by any particular ordinals think, or collections or. I think Patrick has the most ordinals, actually, to tell you the truth. He has more than me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any ordinals. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I've personally inscribed only two. I am embarrassed to admit, but like I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in the technology and what's happening. I'm, I'm less of a collector, but maybe I should, I should change that. Um, you should probably get your hands on some ordinals. <laughs> yeah, there are, you, you know, um, so the, uh, the Bitcoin punks, the, uh, the crypto punks, um, derivative, let's say, for being generous here. Um, if you invested one Bitcoin in those 24, 48 hours later, you would have had 145 Bitcoin. I uh, I didn't, I remember I was on like, I was in a meeting. I think they'll get more extreme, by the way, that ratio over time. Sorry. I, and, and, and Nick, my co-founder messaged me like, mint as many of these as you can, right? And I think there was like a thousand minted out of 10,000 at the time. And I'm like, I'll take my time. You know, I, I ended up getting like 20 or something, like not, not a huge amount, but like, uh, I'm looking back at that. Like it's, it's crazy. The Bitcoin how, punks. You got yeah. 20 Bitcoin punks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to spread it with the team. Cause like they, they asked for some or whatever. So, um, they're not, they're not all going to be personally. All right, I'm, I'm going to sure ask you, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to check with your team in a couple of weeks here to see, make sure you, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah you know, I, it's out in public here. now. So yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And also the, the highest, so one of the interesting things is that I think people don't realize is that, um, I, if you, you ever seen that, that, uh, movie where there's like a, uh, it's, it's like, uh, not a movie, but a, um, a video where there's like a yacht in the, in the river and it's pulling up and it's like a pretty cool yacht. And then like a mega yacht pulls up right behind it. And it's like, this is, this is the Ethereum whales, like the, the, the normal yacht and the megawatt is the Bitcoin whales. And so a lot of these are trading for like one Bitcoin as if it's, as if it's one Ethereum, you know what I mean? But it's actually 10, one Bitcoin is uh, 10 Ethereum. People have a, an inherent unit bias where it's like, it's kind of like something valuable is worth at least one, you know what I'm saying? And so we've seen, um, you know, already sales of 11.5, uh, the Ord punks, which is under 600 inscription number. One of those sold for 11.5 BTC, which is $260,000. And this is like, we're in week two here of, of these ordinals. And so that's part of, the, part of the reason why people are super excited, obviously the speculation, but underlying that speculation is solid fundamentals and very interesting technology and a historical moment in, in the larger community. Totally. Are you saying list prices and sats? <clears throat> Don't list prices and sats for the no list prices and sats. Definitely <laughs> not. Um, uh, if I'm selling if I'm selling one of my ordinals and I have to list it in sats, I'm going to another marketplace. Um, one other interesting kind of thing about this is like, um, you know, if Bitcoin is like the internet's money. Ordinals might be like um, uh, the inscriptions of internet culture, and internet culture is going to outgrow and probably already has outgrown American culture. And um, so I, I think, I think like the art world, the media world um, uh, could, could be, um, could be, let's just say Bitcoin ordinals could end up being insanely culturally important artifacts Um I mean, they, it seems like they already are becoming that, but in years to come, I think, I think people are going to look back. I think people like knock on wood, but I think people are going to look back on these things and be like, oh, that's the shelling point for all NFTs. You know, like the first 10,000 ordinals, I think will probably be worth more culturally uh, than any 10,000 collection that's ever been minted on, on Ethereum or Solana or what have you.
Yeah, uh, I agree. We're coming and up I, in time I, here. Yep. All right. Finish yeah. your thought, Trevor, and then maybe we can wrap it up. Yeah. The, the last thing I was going to say is like to to help everyone in the audience like think about this. It's like if I were to give you an NFT right now that's worth a million dollars, a priceless uh, like your dream artwork that you want to forever have, and it's and it's extremely valuable, over a million dollars. Would you want to have that on IPFS? where you don't even know anyone who runs a node or you don't know how it works, or do you have that on Bitcoin where you probably know several people who run their own nodes and you can run your own node in two clicks by going to Bitcoin core, downloading the client. And it's, it runs as easily as any iPhone app just need, you know, you need 500 gigabytes, but you can get an external hard drive SSD. Um, you know, where would you want that prices artwork to be? On Bitcoin. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Like if you if you had the Mona Lisa, like would you store it in the Louvre or you know some like startup museum that's just coming about and you know they're growing really quickly? Like who would you trust it with? I think Da Vinci right. would would want the Louvre. I, I think he would. Um, all right, we are at one thirty one. Uh, cannot thank our our four guests enough for really getting into it you know uh, any new innovation on bitcoin is going to require and demand and warrant a lot of hardcore discussion and thinking about edge cases and gaps in our knowledge and learnings from other blockchain protocols but as as we've discussed it feels like ordinals is like a, an amazing confluence of of a bunch of factors that that is finally bringing a lightning strike to Bitcoin for, for the first time in a while. And uh, I've just loved to see the excitement. I've loved to see the the Twitter hype and everything. And um, honestly, hats off goes to a lot of the guests on this call for for really pushing it forward and, and doing the innovation and quick uh, midnight development sprints to, to get features off the ground. So I uh, cannot thank you enough for your work on Bitcoin Ordinals, but also for joining us today and, and sharing a bit of insight with our audience. Um, anyone have any closing words for, for our guests? Get inscribing, get a node <laughs> or, or use one of the inscription services, sync your node and, 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 and let's make this happen. I agree. Inscribe, yeah. inscribe anything because it's yeah. we're at, we're at over a hundred thousand now. Uh, you know when these when Jamil first found out these, he's like, "Oh, 150. I got plenty of time." Then it, it blew, blew past a thousand. <laughs> then he went to sleep the next day. It was past two thousand. The next day it was past ten thousand. And you know you blink an eye, and and like you may think there's a lot of these now, a hundred thousand, but. You know, there's a lot like Bitcoin is going to appeal to a lot of people to, you know, potentially a billion people on this planet. Right. A million might look like a small number in the future. So, you know, you're here now and and make sure you make your your inscription on the uh, on the chain. Inscribe your vibe. <laughs> Inscribe your vibe. That's you, you, you already right there. one time quota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. That's fair. Hey, that's a that's a free slogan. That's not a pun. You know, you, you can take that. <laughs> um all right thank all you right. guys so much for joining audience thanks, thanks for sticking too. around and asking great questions and we will see you the next time thanks everyone